ads. You know, I always come when I, when I preach these messages, there's always a little uneasiness by some folks and queasiness. Uh, uh, these are ideals that we're presenting. It's like when we preach on a dad or a mom, we raise these high standards. These are the things that we aim for. This is what our, our desire and our passion is when we preach sermons like this. We all know that the ideal doesn't always work out, that there's challenges. Sometimes you can see in the scriptures, you can have some of the, some of the godliest people in the world, but some of the meanest kids in the world, amen? And you can see some of the meanest kids in the world, some of the godliest kids in the world, but the worst moms and dads. You see, you know, how they ever turn out so good? Uh, so there's lots of scriptural examples of that. But when we lay out these foundations for us today, I want you to pay specific and close and clear attention because these are important biblical principles. These are the ideals that God has for us in home and in family. And it's important that we learn to embrace these ideals and say, those are my goals. That's my objective. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what I want. I believe there's a word to us today. It's, it, no matter where we are in this process called family, we all came from one somehow and somewhere. Amen. And some of you are in the child phase of that, teenage phase of that. Some of you are in the singles phase of that. Some of you are in the married phase of that. Some of you are in the married with kids and some of you are married with your kids' kids. Amen. <laughs> and some of you are grandparents who are overwatching and seeing that your children raise their families. So no matter where you are in this whole ordeal, there's a word for you in the context of what we're going to be preaching today and sharing with you about family foundations. So as we talk about this, we know that what the Bible presents and what culture presents are two different, different scenarios. In fact, according to culture, the family is pretty much an old, dead, passe issue. It's, it's no longer necessary. But I want you to know, according to what the Bible says, foundation of family is paramount, and it's more than relevant. And we need to realize the truth of what the Bible has to say. So I want to look at some things. As we look back, obviously, and talk about biblical principles, we should look to you know, the original plan, the blueprint that God gives us in the book of Genesis. And there's two things you're going to discover there. One is... Family is God's idea. He's the one who created Adam, and out of Adam he brings Eve, and he places them in this environment, and he starts the first home, he conducts the first marriage ceremony, and he oversees it, and shows us that marriage and family and holy matrimony is paramount in the mind of God, that it is his idea, and that we ought to be paying closer attention to what God's blueprint and his pattern are. The second thing you see in this original plan is that man was not created to be alone. Well, those words to Adam when he tells him, you know, Adam, it is not good for you to be alone. And so Adam is ultimately given Eve this perfect gift for him to meet that standard of fellowship in his life that God had intended for him. Never to be alone. And that's an important principle to, to understand. It's, it's not good for any of us to be alone. That's why if you are single... It's important for you to find deeper relationships, you know, in life and in the church and the family of God and other believers as well. Till God changes that. We need a genuine accountability to other people. Nobody was intended to live without that. Nobody's intended to live as an island. Well, I just touch people when I want to touch them. I'll be involved with people when I want to be involved. It's not supposed to work like that. Out of this, we understand we need God, but we also understand we need others, and we need each other. And it's important that you get that very quickly in your life or you'll grow up with this kind of little island mentality that it's just about me and what makes me happy and what fulfills my life. And you're going to miss some great and abundant blessings that God has for you. But let's talk about this a little bit closer. There's four things I want to share with you today of what the Bible teaches. Now, of course, there's a lot more that comes under this, but we're just going to hit four top points today and we'll cover a little bit more next week as we talk about four things that families for. First of all, it's for shelter from the storms of life. In the fear of the Lord, it tells us in Proverbs 14, is strong confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. Great verse, one of my favorite Proverbs in, in reality, because there it talks about when we learn to honor God, respect God, that he is God, and there is no other, we're going to find a place of strong confidence. And we're living in a world where a lot of people are, live with a multitude of insecurities. They don't live with a lot of confidence in life. They don't have confidence in themselves. They don't have confidence in their ability. They don't have confidence in, in relationships. But it's going to start with what we say first of all, foremost, is our relationship to God. But then God's, God likens everything that he's doing and saving us and bringing us to him as a family unit and a family relationship. That we are his children. And as his children, God provides for us a place of refuge. What home is supposed to be for all of us and what family is supposed to be is that place of refuge. 
Now, I know that uh, in life, we deal with a lot of things which create a desperate need for all of us to have a place that we can go to where we find refuge. You say, what kind of, what kind of deals we have to deal with? Well, there's three basic storms of life you can categorize most all of them under, especially when dealing with our children. The first is, is change. We live in a world that's always changing. Standards are always changing. Family mindsets of what family is, what relationship, all that, the world has it so backwards and so perverted, so messed up, it's hard for us to realize. But there are other changes that people deal with in life. Changes that your children have to face with. Sometimes it's in illness, sometimes it's in death. I mean, graduation can be a big change, amen? So there's all these changes that people go through. We need a place of refuge. We need a place where we can find security from a changing world beauty of my relationship with the Lord is that he is steadfast. Hallelujah. He's, he's always reliable. I can always count on him. Your home needs to be that same kind of place when your children and situations arise that create change that they're going to find a place of confidence, shelter there. But also another great storm of life has to do with failure. You know, we don't always win. Contrary to popular opinion, the reality of the fact is not everybody gets a trophy. Amen. Not everybody gets the blue ribbon. And we need to learn how to lose in life. We need to learn how to fail in life. And we, we have to experience those things before we can ever really experience what genuine successes are. Your children have to learn what it means to come in last, perhaps, or to be second. You're not always first. As much as we would like that, that's not the way it works out. And it's in this environment, this place of refuge, this place of safety, that when we face the storms of failure, we have a place to go to. We have a place that no matter what, we're going to be received. No matter what, we're going to be loved. No matter what, people are going to care for us. That's what we call family. That's what we call home. Doesn't mean we're always going to be right. I, what is that passage in Ecclesiastes where chapter 4 and says, you know, it says that, that, there's, that two are better than one. And remember, as it goes through, it talks about the message, you know, we, can, we have a great reward when there's more than one because if one falls by himself, he has no one to pick him up. But if he falls with another, he has someone to offer him assistance. That's what family's for. The third change we face in our life is rejection. I don't know about you, but rejection happens real early on as a kid. School, playgrounds can be the meanest place in the world. Amen. For all the name calling goes on, it's where all the comparisons going on. If you fail in front of everybody as a child, be sure every other kid's going to tell you about it. We just have these experiences of, 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 of failure. And kids, kids can be cruel. I mean, I mean, kids can be the meanest people in the world at times. And, and it just comes natural because of our little sin natures. Amen? It just flows as part of our life. And so what we want to do is, is have in our home a, a place where our children are facing times of rejection. They know there's always acceptance at home. I love that passage in Ephesians. It says that we are now accepted into the beloved. In other words, that God receives us. And for God to receive me, that's all grace. I don't have to prove myself to God. I don't have to measure up. I can't measure up. That's the beauty of grace. Grace knows I can't measure up, and still God reaches down in his mercy. So family and home should be the place we can come, even in the midst of rejection by everything else and find the acceptance of one of God and acceptance of each other. Now, these are important values in our life that, that we have to protect the generation, but not just your kids, but every grandparent here, as well as every parent here, has this responsibility to demonstrate this kind of relationship and to demonstrate this kind of life that no matter what happens, I understand you. No matter what you go through, I love you. No matter what goes on, we need to learn how to understand and how to accept. You say, I'm not sure I know how to do that. Well, let me give you three simple things that convey understanding. Hearing, hugging, and helping. It doesn't take a master's degree in this. All right? Hearing, that's a hard one for folks. You know? Especially for me, I like to give the answer before they finish telling me the problem. No, nope, my son needs to shut up right there. <laughs> Like to give the answer. Sometimes it's best to be quiet and hear what's being said. And then, obviously, I think the, as equally as important is you just got sometimes to put your arms around them. Now, I know that we like to give answers, and sometimes, honestly, we don't have the answers. 
As parents, there were times I just said, I don't have the answer. As a husband, there's been times I've had to tell my I don't have the answer. But I do know who has the answer. And we can hug each other until the answer comes. And we can help each other until the answer comes. And sometimes the wisest thing you can do is just say, hey, I don't know. You know, it's like Jehoshaphat when he's surrounded by the enemy. He said, Lord, I don't know what to do, but our eyes on you. We're looking to you. And so you're directing them in this regard. And that's some of the best communication tools you'll ever get right there. Those three simple little hints to how you'd help people, you know. And I believe you know, this is why divorce is so painful. If this is what home is for. This is why divorce hurts on such a deep, deep level for those in, in families and those who've experienced this. You know, when God makes two one, divorce seems to just be ripping you apart and it rips your family apart and it tears the very fiber of all that you are. That's why it's important we understand these principles of home ultimately is for sheltering one another, caring for one another, hearing one another, hugging and helping in this process. Second, not just a shelter, it's a learning center for life. Psalms tells us this, that our sons may be as plants that have grown up in their youth and that our daughters may be a cornerstone, polished after the similitude of a palace. What's he saying? We want for our home to be a place where our children grow into strong, balanced people of character and people of integrity, people who are the cornerstones, people who are the foundation stones for other relationships. He's talking about the fact that this is the place that we learn. Home's the place where we get our education. All of us, like it or not, are supposed to be homeschooled in the important things of life, in the valuable things of life. Home's where we learn these issues and what's really important to us. And if we miss it here and we miss instruction and we miss discipleship and we miss the, the chastening even that comes along with, with that kind of instruction, then we've missed too much. Ephesians tells us that we're to raise and train our children. Proverbs tells us to train our children. Over and over again, throughout the Word of God, we have these important scriptures that tell us we have responsibility for instructing our families, parents, grandparents. You've heard me say it before. It's a multi-generational responsibility. My kids and then to my kids' kids, hey, and to my, my family and myself as well. My generation, the next generation, and the third. And if the Lord allows the next in time, but we're continuing having this influence. We're saying, hey, you need instruction and we all need instruction and it starts here and this is the most important place that you're going to get instruction. Chastening, instruction, education. These are all words that mean the same thing. Now, I think many times when we think of discipline, we don't think of discipleship, but they're one and the same thing. Sometimes the learning has to come the hard way. That's when we use that word, we think of discipline, the chastening part. But the biggest part, you know, uh, of, of, of doing this, the bottom line in training kids is knowing which end to pat and when to pat it. Amen. <laughs> because sometimes it needs patting thoroughly. Amen. So it's a place for, for learning. So what are we going to learn? We take a child through three stages in family. Parents, grandparents, this should be your goal. First of all, they need to learn understand parental control. The Bible gives us that first command of the promise and as children obey your parents, right? For this it's good, and your life will be blessed. You'll have a long life. That's the promise of God. Good, blessed, long life. So we want our children to understand how important it is that they understand that mom and dad are in charge, and they're under their authority, and they're under their control. Hey, if they never learn that, they'll never understand the third one we'll mention in a moment. And they'll certainly miss the second one, which is self-control. The Bible tells us that authority, our authority, comes from being under authority. So as I'm under God's authority... All right, submitting to any authority he's put under me, guess what, I have authority. But if I reject God's authority, then I don't have much authority in life at all. I can yell and I can scream and I can raise my voice and say I'm the king of this castle, but it's not gonna mean anything. Unless the power and the influence of God's authority is over my life, then I have some authority and I have some power and some influence to, to, to function within. So the first comes this, this parental control and then comes from that we learn how to have self-control. Self-control at home, that's where we learn it. When kids want their way and don't get their way. When kids want that toy and don't necessarily get that toy. When kids have something to take from them, they don't get to bite and they don't get to lash out and they don't get to scream and they don't get to whine and they don't get to cry. They learn the important lessons about this is how we deal with disciplining ourselves. This is how we bring our emotions under control. What's ultimately, as they get older, this is what we want them to learn. They're being controlled by God. I want the Lord to be the Lord of their life, the Lord of their heart, the Lord of their actions, the Lord of their character. 
These are the important issues. So if you're looking for something to say, I need some important things. I mean, the, the bottom line for, for this home training is, hey, you need to teach them the importance of obeying the parents, then learning how to have self-control in their life, and then how to surrender to the authority and the, and the control of their heavenly father. The goal is to grow. I think it's, li it's listed in, 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 in Luke when it says that Jesus, after the temple experience, when he went down as a child of the temple and they came back and got him, it says that Jesus grew four ways. It says he increased in wisdom and stature and, and in favor with God and in favor with man. That's the idea of the whole child. You're dealing with him intellectually. You're dealing with the child physically. You're dealing with the child spiritually. You're dealing with the child socially. Jesus grew and advanced and matured in those areas. A goal of a parent and a grandparent for a child and a grandchild all to be these same things. We want to have wisdom, good intelligence, you know. And sometimes, we've been studying Proverbs. And sometimes you see that Proverbs just kind of, many times kind of relates itself in the, the whole idea of having good common sense based on Scripture. There's a lot of people who have much common sense these days. I mean, just common sense. People do the stupidest things and expect a completely different reaction from their, from their action. I mean, they say, why'd that happen to me? Well, stupid, you jumped off the building. That's why you broke your leg. You know, they do bizarre things and expect some kind of, that's not wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to be able to understand where you're at and what you're going through and what's around the next corner. It's the ability to have discernment in your life. And this deals with our, all of our life, all the way to the, the spiritual, the social, the physical well-being of our life. So we want our children to grow. How do we do that? We're instructing, we're guiding, we're leading, we're providing a place of shelter, we're providing a place of education. But, but, you know, the, these are lessons they have to learn. There's some lessons they're going to leave home with and they're not going to have succeeded them, but the lessons they need to learn, first of all, is relationships. How do you le relate to people? How do you relate to people in authority? How do you relate to people that are equal? How do you relate to people that are under? All around, people need to learn how to live relationships properly. They learn that at the house. That's why you don't let your children, when they're going through that sibling rivalry stage, just go at it. You know, they're to be given instruction. This is the way we relate to each other. This is the way we relate to people. A great deal, you know, of happiness depends on your ability to relate to other people. A great deal of success in your life will be based upon how well you relate to other people. And if you don't learn how to relate to other people, you will not succeed in this life. Character is important. That element that we, we learn not by hearing what our parents say, but by seeing what our parents do. I can say all day long, you know, you shouldn't tell lies. You shouldn't tell lies. But if one of the kids picks my phone up, you know, and someone's calling me and they pick the phone up and I'm saying, Shh, tell them I'm not here. <laughs> what kind of character does that show? I just told them not to lie, but now what am I modeling for them? I'm just telling a lie. So what kind, what kind of lessons are being learned there? There's not going to be any character that's really going to be developed for that. So character are the things that not so much taught as they are caught that are brought on by what they see you do. Someone said you ought to live in such a way that you wouldn't be ashamed to sell your parrot to the town gossip. <laughs> I'll just think about that for a minute. <laughs> tell everything on you. Hopefully there's nothing to tell, amen? Third thing is values. This is what's important. Well, you teach them what's important. What's important about time? What's important about money? What's important about things? What's important about God? What's important about other people? What's important about sex? We teach them the values of life and living as they're growing and as they're going. And in the process, they learn. Isaiah put it this way. He says, you know, one generation makes known thy faithfulness to the next generation. Isaiah speaks of it like this. The living, the living shall praise thee as do thy daughter at this day as thy father to the children shall make known thy truth. You have responsibility to share what real values are and what's important in life because if they seek to learn their values from the world around them, they'll have no values. They'll have no standards. They'll have no convictions. We're living in the day and the age when every man, as it says in the book of Genesis, did what was right in his own sight. In other words, we're living in a day when people determine their own setup, setup and system of values. What's important? 
well, what's important is whatever I think is important. No, God's given us a standard by which we live in and which we, when we can go to and we can learn what's important. Then as a man, you as a woman, as a parent, as a grandparent, I have this continual obligation, no matter where my family's at, no matter what way age we all are, no matter how, how far apart we may be or how close we may be, to continue to live this before them to show them what's important. It's what Deuteronomy is saying when he talks about, you know, it, these words that I'm commanding you this day, they shall be in your heart. It has to start with your own heart, a heart that's right with God. Then what? Then you shall teach them diligently unto your children. And then you shall talk of them when, you sit, when you're sitting in the house and when you walk by the way and when you, when you lie down and when you rise up. What's he saying? He says, every opportunity in your life becomes a platform for instruction for teaching the important things of life. Even when you're going to bed, even when you're getting up, those have a message in them to the generation that follows behind you. The way you live your life. There's four important values you ought to be teaching your kids. One is first of all, they've got to have a commitment to God. That's the most important thing in life. You want to know what values are? That's the most valuable commodity you can ever hand to somebody. You give your life to Jesus thoroughly, completely, and God will do a work in your life. It'll change you for eternity. A commitment to personal family growth, that they're involved with others, they're growing themselves, they're growing as part of the, this union and this family that they're a part of. A commitment of trust. This is an important lesson. I, I heard so many teenagers tell me this before. Oh, you know, my five parents don't trust me. How many kids are saying that today? How many have you have given them a reason to trust you? An important principle you learn while you're in your family is this issue that trust is earned. It's a valuable commodity, and it is earned. I trust you as you, if you're continuing to do things that cause me not to trust you, then don't expect me to trust you. Trust this valuable, important lesson. And then the desire to make a contribution in life. That life's not all about you. What you get, what makes you blessed, what makes you happy, what satisfies you. That seems to be, as I listen to a lot of contemporary Christian preachers today, the, the, the end all, be blessed, be prosperous, be happy. It's all about you, your best life now. But hey, the truth of the matter is not all about you. It's not all about you, and you're here for a reason. And even when you come to Christ, the Bible says that no longer you're living to yourself, you're living to God, and you're living to be a minister of reconciliation. What's that mean? Your life's involved with other people and bringing them closer to God as well. If you miss those important lessons right there, that your life has an eternal value, that your life has an important strategic spiritual value that, that bears out in eternity, that how you live your life right now and how you impact other people's lives right now, man, if you don't learn that lesson, by the, when, by the time you die and get to heaven, you're going to stand there empty-handed one day before the Lord. You may well get into heaven because salvation is by grace if you trusted the Lord. But you just lived completely wrong in regard to your mindset of what life is really all about. Life is about making a difference in other people's life. The third important fact about family I'm talking about today, it's a place for, for fun. Family should be fun. Family should be having a good time. You ought to be able to laugh as family. And a lot of people, y'all know the story, it comes out every year on TV, you know, the, what's, what's the, the, the captain with all the kids the, has the whistle, blows them out. Sound of music, thank you very much. <laughs> You've got up and teen kids, you know, and they're all reporting for duty every day until the nun comes in and starts teaching them the sound of music in their home and they all start singing together and having fun together and laughing together. Hey, it's one thing to be regimented and it's needed to have regimentation, but what is just equally as needed is acceptance and laughter and joy. The Bible says that Jesus was anointed with the oil of joy above all his fellows. There was joy in the life of Jesus Christ. There should be joy in our hearts. There ought to be joy in our homes. There ought to be joy in our family. I mean, it, family should be fun. It should be an exciting place to be. In a relationship with a man and woman, what's God say? Enjoy your wife. And it replaces that in, places, in Scripture, not only there, but other places, like in Psalm, be happy with your wife and, and, and find your joy with the wife you're married to or the wife of your youth. I mean, are you having fun in your marriage? If you're not having fun in your marriage, you're probably not having fun in your house. You know, you, some of y'all need to lighten up. You know, 
you go to a marriage conference, see all these ideals, and you get mad because your husband doesn't reach that ideal. Amen? Your wife, she's not that perfect, Proverbs 31. Hey, it's a process. All right? It's one thing to know what they are. It's another thing to be moving towards them. Or if you're not moving towards them, shame on you, but you ought to be moving towards the ideals. You ought to be moving towards the goal. And in the, in the, the, but there is, for lack of better terminology, there's joy in the journey. There's excitement along the process and in the pathway of enjoying family. Kids are funny. Grandkids are just as funny. I mean, kids can be, I, I, you know, I don't want to use the word stupid because that's not really the right terminology, but it seems kind of stupid some of the stuff they do, right? I won't tell on my kids today. They're, one of them is here. So I'm going to tell on Terry Acker's kids. No. <laughs> no, kids are hilarious. You know, I've, I can just think of my granddaughters. They're just funny just to watch. All of a sudden, they'd be off doing something, dancing in the corner, just, you know, not, they're just in their own little world. And it's just, it just fills your heart with a joy, with excitement. And you need to embrace those moments that you get like that because those are the moments your children will ultimately remember and your grandchildren remember. They don't want to see you as, you know, they call me poppy at my house, all right? I don't want my grandkids to grow up with this mindset that when after I'm long gone, oh, poppy, he was a mean old dude. <laughs> he'd come into his house, he'd slap you upside the head with a Bible. You wore a hat in the house, you better take that hat off. Yeah. <laughs> enjoy the relationship and enjoy life, you know, that God has given you because kids are a blast. I told them that Kathy didn't want me to tell this story, but she's sitting at the back, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I can't see her without my glasses on this morning. But I told the story about the kid that sucked his thumb. You know, his mother, he's four years old. He's still sucking his thumb and he keeps sucking his thumb. She's tried painting it with lemon juice, all the little home remedies you can do about how to stop your kid from sucking their thumb. He won't do it. Finally, one day she says, listen, you keep sucking your thumb like that, your stomach's going to blow up like a giant balloon. Of course, later that afternoon, they were at the park, and there was a pregnant woman. <laughs> he studies her for a bit, and he walks up to her and says, I know what you've been doing. <laughs> Kids are a blast. Those children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. His arrows in the hand of a mighty man are the children of the youth. Happy is the man who hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. What's he saying here? There's a blessing to having children in the home. There's a blessing that comes. That it's, it, it comes from God, and it's something that can't be explained in, in terms of humanity. It's something that the Spirit of God does in bringing fullness of joy into a heart and to a life. It's a blessing. Children, family need to understand that. But fourth, and I'll close with this, if family's a launch pad for ministry. There's a great passage in 1 Corinthians. This guy, Stephanus, I'd love to have known him. I'll get to meet him one day. But it talks about Stephanus, and, and, and the apostle is talking to the church. He says, you know, take note of Stephanus, you know. You know, that, it, it, that guy, he was one of the first people who got saved in Asia. And he said, that guy and his family, they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Now, there's a lot of addictions you can get. This is one of the best. Get addicted to loving Jesus and serving Jesus. That's the best addiction. That's the only thing that cured my addictions in the world. Just fall in love with Jesus and the ministry of the saints. And family should be that place. It excites me when I see so many of you that can commit yourselves to go on mission trips and vacation Bible schools and Awanas and camps like that as a ministry. And families, when you get in there and you're serving the Lord together. Me, some of the most exciting times in my ministry have been when I've been on stage somewhere ministering and my children have been on stage there with me ministering and being a part of that. And, and those who've done that, you know what I'm talking about, being involved in ministry. And it doesn't have to be a, an actual mission trip. I mean, there's lots of things you can do as a family. There's hospital ministries. There's just opening your home up for ministry. There's inviting people into your home and their families in to be a part of your family, and you minister to them there. There's so many ways and so many places that we can touch people's lives, just often just simplest things that are overlooked of just opening up our lives and dedicating our family to say, you know, it's like we preached about last week, and Josh said, I don't know about you, but for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. But to serve the Lord means to serve people. To serve the Lord means ministry, and ministry involves others. To serve the Lord is not about you getting the, the recognition. It's not about you getting the applause. It's not about you having the record sales, the book sales, the T-shirt sales, or whatever it might be. It's all about you 
and yourself being a part of what God is doing in the world to touch the lives of other people. That's why no matter where you are, you may be here today as, as a widow person or a single person or a single mom or, you know, whatever. You need to be involved with other people and with ministries and other people's lives and things. I think all too often we're living in a culture, in a generation that misses the mark due to the fact that we're living in such a selfish world, so self-absorbed. You know, study after study, and I'm not going to read, I had read some early this morning. One was from Zig Ziglar, but he made the important point. And after, after 20 years, he said this, and he said this 15, 20 years ago, back in 1989, 1990. He was talking about, as they, as they interviewed the vice presidents of the most top Fortune 500 companies, they found out that most of these guys, 89% of them, had been married only once, married their high school or college sweetheart. Most of them, 89% of them, spent about eight to 10 hours a day of working, were committed to their families and committed to spending time with their families and were some of the most successful men in the world. Why? Because they had a balance to what life was doing, and, but they were committed to the most important things. And the most important things is not about making more money, I sat down with a guy this last, just, it was Thursday. And as I'm sitting there talking, he says, you know, he said that one of the worst days of my life was I found out the longer I worked, the more money I could make. <laughs> I get paid by the hour. I said, well, come into the ministry then. <laughs> he said, and I just let it absorb so much of my time and so much of my life and so much of my world because it's all about making more money all about getting the almighty dollar. And I missed what life was about. What happens? We're dedicated, but to the wrong things. What do we need to be dedicated to? The most important things, the things that matter, the things of value. We learn those in our homes. We learn those in our families. Simple statement would be this. The common missing ingredient in many marriages is the dedication to make things work. There's a lot of things that perhaps you've gone through in your relationship with your spouse that the average relationship would have divorced, broken up, and sent, gone off different directions already. But you had a commitment to make things work. That's going to pay off in the long run, trust me. You were dedicated to stay the course, to keep your eyes focused. You meant what you said when we said, till death do us part. And it's been difficult perhaps at times, challenging at other times, but you did what you knew in your heart God told you to do, that's the avenue, that's the pathway to find great success in your life because that's the things that are important. If you're, if you really want to succeed, if you really do want the grace of God in your home and in your life, you've got to come back to this position, first and foremost, my commitment to God. As a husband, as a wife, as a dad, as a mom, as a grandparent, and even as a young person sitting in this room, you will rise or fall in life. First of all, your dedication to God and your willingness to be dedicated to the things that God sets before you. That's where you'll find the grace and the blessings of God. Otherwise, family won't be a place of shelter. It won't be a learning center. It won't be a time of laughter and fun. And it certainly won't be a launch pad for ministry. If you're not secure in your relationship with the Lord, you're probably not going to be secure in any of these other relationships. So first and foremost, as we wrap this up, how are you in Jesus? How's your walk with God? Some of you this morning are, are sitting there and you're looking at me and you're, you're thinking, man, my relationship with God is not where it ought to be. It's not where it ought to be. I love the Lord. Excuse me. If you love the Lord, then move back to where you're supposed to be. Don't say you love the Lord if you're going to walk in rebellion. Let's get real. There's no reason, there's no excuse for you not to come back to the place of commitment to Christ and Jesus as the Lord of your life. The, the only one standing in the way of that is you. You're the only person you've got to walk around or walk through to get to the cross. Just you. Well, you don't know about my issues. You are your issues. <laughs> You're the issue. You've got to take you to the cross. 
And that's where you find life. Repent and believe, Jesus put it, those words so simple, lest you perish. And I would say today, if we don't want our families to perish, our homes to perish, our children, our grandchildren to perish, let's get ourselves right with God. Let's be what God called us to be. Would you stand with your heads bowed?